We'll begin reading together in uh, chapter 39 at verse 1. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just read verse 1 and we'll get into our study. We're going to look through the 39th chapter here in Ezekiel. Prophecy against Gog. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tobal. And so obviously, as I was mentioning a moment ago, as we were looking at chapter 38, chapters 38 and 39 actually go together. So this is a continuation of God's condemnation of one who is referred to as Gog. Now, last time we together, I mentioned to you that Gog is a title. It literally means high or supreme one, and it's Gog of the land of Magog. And so as I was pointing out last time we were together, in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, Magog is the son of Japheth. This would represent Central Asia or the southern part of what is called ancient Russia. And I was pointing that out last time. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at a prophecy concerning a leader as well as a particular portion of, of geography. That would be, it would be, um, as he says, Gog, he speaks of Rosh, Meshach, and Tabal. So he'd be speaking concerning certain areas of land. It would be southern Russia. It would be uh, in Turkey as well as northern Iran. And so that's what we were looking at last time. And this is simply a continuation of that. And so he's speaking against this particular people group. And so he says in verse 2, I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And it's interesting how this is put. I will turn you around and lead you on is an interesting phrase it's actually a picture of a man who is walking next to an animal. It's like a man who's walking uh, uh, next to a dog, a dog that's on a leash. And so what it is, is it's a picture. It's a picture of God who is sovereignly bringing Israel's enemies into the land of Israel in order that he might judge them. And so from the human perspective, Israel is going to be invaded because people are going to be entering in. Now, this particular people, as we saw last time, are people who want to come into Israel in order that they might pillage her. In, in chapter 38, verses 11 and 12, remember what it says there. It says, You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. And so the motive is to come in and to pillage Israel. The motive is to take Israel, take her land, and basically rob her. And so God is speaking to this particular people group, and he's saying, I'm bringing judgment on you. So notice what he says in verse 3. He says, then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. He says, you're going to be coming in with the intention of invading Israel to pillage her to take her land and to take everything that she possesses. But I want you to know that I'm going to be in opposition to you. I want you to know that I'm going to allow you to come in, even give you opportunity and even allow you to exercise that desire of your heart to come in to invade. And as you come in, you are going to be absolutely dealt with. When he says, I will knock the bow out of your left hand, cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand, he's saying, I'm going to shut down your weapon systems. Your weapon systems are going to be shut down to the point where you are, that you are powerless. I'm going to take away not only your weapon system, your bow, but I'm also going to take away your ammunition. I'm going to take away everything, in other words, that you rely on when you come in against the nation of Israel. Now, you may come in fortified. You may come in with a great military group. You are going to come in with a confederation of a variety of nations with the anticipation of taking Israel because Israel will be at ease, be living securely and at peace at that time. So you're going to enter in in a way thinking that you're going to surprise them, overtake them, and destroy them. But I want you to know that as you come into the land, it's really a setup because I'm going to take you out. I'm going to destroy you. Notice how he says in verse 4, You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops, and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort, 
and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. When he says you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, this is kind of interesting. You see, before 1967, and when you go to Israel, you'll hear this story over and over again. Before 1967, Jordan actually controlled all the ranges there, all the mountain ranges. There was just a small corridor that was controlled by, by, uh, by Israel there in the area of Jerusalem. But after the Six-Day War, Israel regained all of the mountain ranges there in her territory. And so what the Lord is saying here is he's, he's saying to them, you're going to fall upon the mountains of Israel. You're going to fall upon the territory that is once again controlled by Israel, and you and your allies are going to be completely defeated. And there's going to be such a carnage, there's going to be such a destruction that your bodies will be lying out there in the open. Your corpses will be lying out there in the open. And notice how he says there in verse 4 that he will give them as to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. So he's talking about a complete decimation, a complete carnage. Here they come into the nation of Israel. They come in with this huge confederation of military strength, troops that are bent on destroying, overtaking Israel and pillaging her of all that she owns. And as this confederation enters in, God says, I'm going to disarm you. I'm going to make sure that you have no munitions. I'm going to destroy you and your bodies will lay out in the open and the birds of prey and a variety of other predators are going to take those bodies and devour them. So this is a picture of complete destruction from the hand of the Lord. He says in verse, uh, verse 5, You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken. And I will send fire on Magog and those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Now, as you look at this passage here, there's a couple ways to look at this. Notice how he says in verse 6, I will send fire on Magog and those who live securely in the coastlands. So when he says that, this has been variously interpreted. Uh, most everyone in this room has heard of, of Chuck Missler. And Chuck Missler said this. He said, some analysts see an intercontinental nuclear exchange possibly suggested. With the proliferation of nuclear weapons throughout the world today, such a prospect is disturbingly likely. And so from some perspectives, when he speaks concerning this sending fire on Magog and those who live in security in the coastlands, the coastlands would be the Mediterranean Isles. There are those who would say this sounds like a nuclear exchange. And it sounds as if there's going to be some kind of nuclear um, attack on, on southern Russia and Turkey and northern Iran. And of course, as we look at the newspaper today, we could, we could say, well, I could see how something like that could you know, definitely take place. But there's, uh, there's another perspective that I want to add to this because when you read this passage, I want you to notice this, that the emphasis on judgment is not a judgment that is inflicted by man. It doesn't show, in other words here, that man is cooperating or even being used by God to do this. This judgment isn't inflicted by man, but I want you to notice this is inflicted by God himself. Notice how God says, I will send fire on Magog. And he doesn't mention the use of human agents here. He doesn't say, I'm going to send fire on Magog through Israel. He doesn't say that. He says, I am going to send fire on Magog. And when we've read through these verses here, and I, I didn't point this out, but I will now, notice how he said, I am against you. I will turn you around. I will knock the bow out of your left hand. I will give you to birds of prey. I have spoken. I will send fire. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. I will make my holy name known, and the nation shall know that I am the Lord. And so on the one hand, you have some who are saying that this particular battle here could possibly, Chuck Missler being one of many, could possibly be a nuclear devastation that occurs through the nation of Israel. But you have others who are just as scholarly who would say, well, you have to notice who has taken the, the, the responsibility for all of this. And he's not saying, I will use human agencies to do this. He's saying, I am going to do this. And this fire of judgment is coming from the Lord. 
and it's going to fall on Gog's homeland. It's going to fall on Magog as well as the coastland. And so he's saying as this judgment comes upon you, uh, your allies uh, will be attacked because they have attacked a nation that had been living in peace and in safety. And, and I'm going to take away your peace and safety because of your evil and your arrogance, and I'm going to destroy you. And so one way or another, and, you know, it depends on, on your perspective. I'm, I'm not one who's going to be hard line on this particular thing. You can say perhaps it's going to be God allowing Israel to unleash your nuclear power. Or you can say God doesn't need Israel to do anything. God can do it himself. It depends on your perspective. But the bottom line is Russia is going to be destroyed. Russia is going to be destroyed as Russia attempts to come into Israel and to destroy Israel. And at this point in history, Russia will finally cease being a powerful force in world affairs. This is where Russia is finally going to be dealt with. Now, I realize, of course, that a lot of people think that Russia is an ally or could become an ally to the United States, but there's no indication that that's true whatsoever. And what you do have is, is uh, evidence, I think, to the otherwise. And so what we have even in our day, which I believe is leading up to this particular portion of Scripture, Ezekiel 38, 39, is Russia that has already established alliances with a variety of, of nations that will continue to do so and then ultimately will enter into the nation of Israel in order to take her, in order to destroy her, in order to pillage her and take all that she possesses. It seems that Scripture is very clear about that and it appears very clear in, in history that that is going to be something that will take place. Now, notice how he says in verse 7, I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. And I, I, I had to underscore that one for myself. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. That is something that, that we have to think about because, you know, he's speaking obviously of how, how this confederation has been profaning him, has been speaking ill of him, has been reducing him has been making him less than holy, has been saying things about God that are completely untrue. But as I was thinking about that, I was thinking that that's going to be generally true throughout the whole earth, not just with Russia and her allies, but it's going to be generally true. There's going to be a day, in other words, when God will no longer allow people to profane his holy name. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking on one occasion and was referring to something that is called the, the unpardonable sin. And and he had said that all manner of evil will be forgiven men in the things that they have said. He said, you can make blasphemous comments concerning God the Father. And he said, you can make blasphemous comments concerning uh, Jesus Messiah. He says, but when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness for that. You can be forgiven for blaspheming God and you can be forgiven for blaspheming Jesus Christ. But you will not be forgiven for blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And so I've thought about that quite often, and I, I think in terms of what that could mean and what it does mean. And what it means is this. Before I got saved, I was, I was very guilty of, 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 of using the name of the Lord in vain or saying evil things concerning God, making statements or judgments about the Lord that were improper, that were certainly offensive to Him. And before I got saved, if you would have told me I needed the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I would have said, well, that's your opinion. And I would not have necessarily said uh, intentionally blasphemous things about Jesus per se, but just by rejecting what he had to say, just by rejecting his claim to be the only way to the Father, I was blaspheming Jesus Christ. I was saying that he wasn't what he said he was. But you see, when the Holy Spirit convicted me of sin, righteousness, and judgment, when the Holy Spirit came through the gospel of Jesus and awakened me to the need to get right with God, I did not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I didn't resist or reject Him. When the Holy Spirit convicted me, I came to Christ. Now, as a result of coming to Christ, my, my blasphemous beliefs about God were forgiven. My blasphemous beliefs about Jesus were immediately forgiven because all manner of sin is forgiven at that time because I allowed the Holy Spirit to convict me and responded by faith and repentance, gave my heart to Christ, and all of my sins have been washed away. As John said, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what happened to you too. You may have believed something otherwise about God and how to get to heaven and who Jesus Christ was. 
But when the Holy Spirit convicted you through the preaching of the gospel, you came to an awareness of your lost condition. You didn't know God. You didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you opened your heart to Christ and you said, God, forgive me through Jesus. I'm a sinner and all manner of sin has been completely washed away, all of it. But if I resisted the Holy Spirit, if I rejected that message, if I said, you know, that's good for you and it's not good for me and I died in that condition, what I ultimately do is I am blaspheming the work of the Spirit of God who is intended by God, who was sent by Jesus to convict the world of, of, of our sinful condition. And therefore, I am not going to be forgiven because I rejected the only means of salvation, which is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who had convicted me was being quenched and resisted. Therefore, I die in my sins without salvation. God ultimately is going to deal with people who have blasphemed him. And that's what he's saying. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. They got away with it for a long time. They got mad. They'd use the name of the Lord in vain. They would say things about him that were wrong. He says, but I'm not going to put up with that forever. You see, contrary to what many believe, his patience actually has a limit. When you read the New Testament in the book of Romans, for example, chapter 2, when Paul was writing to the church of Rome in chapter 2 there in the book of Romans, in verses 3 and 4, he, he said, Do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? He's saying God's goodness actually makes a way for you to get right with God. And so his patience ultimately comes to an end because there is a time when, when we ultimately must stand before him. And we stand before him either in the grace of God through Jesus Christ or in our own righteousness. And so he's saying that, he's saying to us, I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. In other, in other words, it's come to the end and I will now deal with them. Verse 8, surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. In other words, your time has run out. It's now time for you to be judged according to my word. You see, Jesus in Matthew 24, 35 said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So God is saying, I am going to judge you even as I said that I would. In verse 9 and 10, Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and spears. They will make fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field nor cut, cut down any from the forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord God. This enormous army, these armies are going to come bringing a great amount of weapons. And his point is very simply taken. Th these weapons will be used for fuel and actual, actually will be a means of preserving natural resources. It's interesting how he says there's going to be enough material to provide Israel with fuel for seven years. And then notice in verse 10 how he says that God is going to bring on the enemy's heads that which, that which they tried to do to Israel. So that which you tried to do is going to be returned to you. And so all of these weapons that you intended for evil are going to actually go into Israel's storehouse and they're going to use it for fuel. And it's going to last for some time because there are so many. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will obstruct travelers, because there they will bury Gog and all his multitude. Therefore, they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it in the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. And they will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. 
the search party will pass through the land. And when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. The name of the city will also be Hamanah. Thus they shall cleanse the land. So instead of them plundering Israel as they intended, they're going to end up being buried. This location is, is there just east of the Dead Sea, across the Jordan to the east. And he's saying there are so many corpses that burial details will be at work burying the dead, and it's going to take them seven months. Now, in Israel, a corpse is unclean, and the land, if it has an, a corpse lying on it, becomes unclean. It's, it's called defiled. And in the book of Numbers, chapter 19, verse 16, it says, Whoever in the open field touches one who is slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be uh, parties of those who go through searching through the land. And they're going to be doing this as, as a profession until they can find every body that has been lying there exposed. Some people will be working a job actually doing that. That's what they'll do for a living, is going out there searching for the dead. We're seeing something like that taking place even right now in Haiti. That's what's taking place now, is people are going out to the mounds and going out to the various places where people have been buried, and they're searching for, for these bodies. They're searching for, for people who may have survived. And even today, I bless the Lord that they found one who had been there for all this time. And so I thank God for that. But ultimately, what's going to take place here is these are going to be dead people lying out, exposed, and they're going to be people who actually have jobs, whose job is to go and find human bones, then place a marker there, then the detail will come to cleanse the land so that it is no longer defiled by the dead. Now notice in verse 13 how he says, the people will gain renown because God is glorified. Now God is going to be glorified through all of this because he destroyed Gog. And he's going to be glorified because his people have finally honored him. And so through all of this, it actually is going to come back on God whose word is true. And he will be glorified through all of this. The psalmist in Psalm 126, verses 2 and 3 says, Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. And so this is going to be a time when they have defeated, well, God has defeated their enemy. And the people will go out there and, and will be cleansing the land and rejoicing for the victory that God has given to them and that God has set them free, that God has actually preserved them. Now, as this is taking place, verse 17, As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, Speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal which I am sacrificing for you, a great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood, that you shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams and lambs, of goats and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You shall eat fat till you are full and drink blood till you are drunk at my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. You shall be filled at my table with horses and riders, with mighty men, and with all the men of war, says the Lord God. The bodies that remain unburied, and as gruesome as this is, it's just a detailed account of what will take place. The bodies that remain unburied are going to become a feast for the carrion. These are the unburied bodies, and these Birds of prey are going to come land on them, as we've seen vultures do in the past, and will devour these bodies, all the bodies of the, of the soldiers, all the bodies of the horses, and all the rest that they had with them. In, in Zephaniah, in chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his guests. And this is what's happening. There's a great slaughter there's irreversible destruction, and it's upon those who actually deserved all of this judgment. Verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. 
So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. So I want to look at this for a few minutes here as we look at this together. Notice verses 21 and 22. I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see, shall see my judgment. This destruction, this destruction that we're reading about in chapters 38 and 39 will have repercussions. The repercussions of this judgment will actually fall upon both Israel as well as the Gentile nations. Now, Israel, when this is taking place, is going to see God's mercy, how that God is merciful to them, and they're actually going to turn to Him. When you go to Israel today, Marie and I were just talking about this this morning, and she was saying to me, she's saying to me just this morning how much she loves the nation of Israel. And I said, I do too. It's, it's, it's a beautiful nation. I said, but you know that some of them are real stinkers. And she says, well, I just love them. I said, I do too. But you know how they can be stinkers with us. And, and, and in the past they have, I'll be honest with you. I mean, there have been times when we've been um, in Israel where, where sometimes they, uh, some of the population just hasn't been really kind. They haven't been really, really um, very polite in some ways. I mean, if you're standing next to a, an elevator, three or four of them may push you out of the way to get on it first. You know, it reminds them of just being home, going to the refrigerator. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll push you out of the way. And that's the way it is. And we've seen that, you know, more than once, I'll be honest with you. And so she was talking to me about how much she loves the nation of Israel. And, and, and I was saying, I do too. But I also realize it's a nation that really has yet to turn to its God. And that's the whole point. I mean, when you go on trips, and sometimes, many times, we have had uh, our, our guides who are not, they are not uh, believers. They may not even be strong um, Jewish in terms of religious beliefs at all. They're simply trained in the history and geography of the nation of Israel. And therefore, when you go with them, they can give you all kinds of stories. They can recite chapter and verse to you. I mean, I have had guides in the past, to give you an example, who were so well-versed and had heard so many messages that when I would go to a site when I first started going to Israel, I actually had this one Orthodox Jewish man uh, turn to me and he'd say, you know, Mark chapter 11 is a real good passage to speak here because it has these things that it says. I mean, this guy knew the New Testament as well as I did and better in some places. And, and you think about it, it's because they have traveled very often with some of the best Bible teachers. This particular guide at that time had been traveling with Pastor Chuck for 20-some years. And he'd heard passage after passage from great pastors. And so I've had more than a few conversations with Jewish guides who have no relationship with God whatsoever, but at the same time, they, they can tell you what the New Testament says about this subject here and, and what should be said. And, and, and you see that. And so in, in some ways, when you're there, there is a, a thing that, that greatly concerns you because they have a lot of information, but they're not, there's no application. And because they don't actually receive that, they don't actually believe that to be true, what they're doing is they're just basically being inoculated against the Word of God. They're not being brought to a relationship with Christ. They're actually becoming so adept at deflecting things that they, they, um, they, they, don't even, they don't even have a sense of conviction. And so, you know, the nation of Israel, sometimes we think of it as being God's promised land and all of that, but we need to remember that right now, it, isn't, it is not a country that worships its God. It is not a, a country that has a relationship with God uh, by, by and large at all. I mean, if you have a Christian, a mess, they call it a messianic congregation. If you have a messianic congregation in, in the nation of Israel that has 30 members, you've got a huge church, 30 people. You've got a huge church, one of the larger ones. If you have 100 people in your congregation, you've got a massive church in Israel because the overwhelming majority of people have rejected Messiah. They have rejected him. There have been times when Marie and I, for example, we were standing one time in, I believe it was Tel Aviv, and as we were standing, uh, a Messianic believer approached Marie and me and handed us a tract. And uh, you may or may not believe this, but Marie and I look Jewish. When we're there, they think that we're Jewish people. 
because the Jewish people there have our coloring. And the largest uh, percentage of people who were coming into, into Israel for the longest time were Spanish Jews. And so they have, they have many times talked to us in Spanish and think that, we are, that we're Spanish Jews when in reality, obviously we're not. We're Americans or Mexicans. I mean, but they don't know that. So they'll come and they speak to us. And on this one occasion, this guy came walking up and handed me a, a Bible track. It was in Hebrew. And as he handed it to me, I didn't know what it was at first, but as I began to look at it, I was able to figure it out pretty quickly. This is a Bible track. And as he handed it to me, I began to look towards the guy who handed it to me when somebody came from the side and, and grabbed it out of my hand and took it from me. Somebody I'd never seen in my life. It was raw. No, somebody that I didn't know. And they came and took it from me and said, don't read that. There is an antagonism. As a matter of fact, several years ago now, we, we uh, Raul, I just teased about him, but Raul and I and one of the other pastors were actually going to have an opportunity to address the Knesset because there was a time when there was, uh, they were passing laws against uh, uh, preaching the gospel to convert Jewish people. And we were, going to, we were going to be going to address them, to speak to them about why it's, it's a proper thing to give us the opportunity or believers the opportunity to share their faith in Israel because they were passing laws against conversion. The nation there is not open at this time to the things of the Lord. But ultimately, God is going to make them open, and that's the whole point. When Russia and this, what I believe could very well be a, 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 a confederation of Muslim states, radical Islam, when they join together to come against the nation of Israel, and God deals with them, and God brings judgment on them, and God says that I take the responsibility for that, it is going to have an effect on the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, when they see God in their defense, when God comes to them and, and, and works in this way, it's going to awaken them. And they'll see God's mercy and how God has been merciful to them, and they will turn to him. In Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, God said, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their own land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. God says, I'm going to place you there, and you are going to remain there. And so as we see Ezekiel speaking about that, he says, the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. When they see God coming in their defense, when they see God working on their behalf, they're going to be awakened to the reality that God is their God. But not only that, notice verses 23 and 24. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. So the Gentiles will know that it was not God's fault that Israel went into captivity. The, the Gentiles will know it's because of their unfaithfulness. They're going to know that, as it says in verse 23, that Israel was unfaithful to God. They're going to know that. And they're going to remember what God had said. Now, in the book of uh, Isaiah... In chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, God was speaking to the nation of Israel there through the prophet Isaiah. And God said, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as, as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. It's interesting when you, when you read your Bible, and I would encourage you to, to look this up and check it out for yourself. It's interesting that when God speaks concerning reason, the only time you have an invitation for the, from the Lord God to reason 
when he says, come, let us reason together. I want you to notice this. Come now, let us reason together. He is not saying to them, and I have to say this very briefly, he is not saying to them or by application to us today, he's not saying, use your intellect to figure me out. He's not saying, look, I'm willing to debate you. I'm willing, to, you, you have a question, I'll answer it. When he's speaking concerning reasoning together there, he isn't saying that, that through human reason, and this is an important point, I hope I don't mess it up. By human reason, by human understanding, he is not saying that by human reason and understanding you can know God. He's not saying that. Now, God has given to us, and, and read Romans chapters 1 through 3, and you'll see this clearly. He has given to us irrefutable proofs. When you look out and you see creation and you see the wonders of it and, and you consider like the writer of Hebrews said, every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. When you realize that just the, the wonder of creation, this could not have happened by chance. It doesn't happen that way. Creation did not just happen through a big bang or some kind of odd um, chance of molecules somehow being able to create what we see today. That, that is not how it happened, but there are many scientists who are incredibly reasonable when they consider that, and they can't see God in that. They can't see it. Yet the Bible says that God used creation to express to us irrefutable proofs of a creator. And I've had more than one person who has been in the, in the hospital room there with their wife when their wife gave birth to their child, who have stated just seeing that take place, to being part of the mystery of life and the creating of life, if you don't believe in God, I don't, I don't know how you can avoid that. You have to willingly not want to believe in God when you see something as simple as, as a, the beauty of childbirth. Or when you take a flower, you can take an artificial flower, a rose, and you can place it next to a, a genuine rose, and just by observing and just by smelling without touching it or really going much deeper than that, maybe from a distance, you can say that that, that artificial rose is absolutely beautiful. But when you take that artificial rose and you put it under a microscope and begin to look at it closer and closer and closer, you don't see perfection, you see imperfection. But when you see a rose under a microscope, the further in, the deeper you look at it, the more wondrous it becomes because creation is that way. So God gives to us, one, through creation, then two, he gives to us a proof through our conscience. Because within us, we know that there is right and we know that there is wrong. But some people's consciences are so twisted that they say that sweet is sour and sour is sweet. They say light is dark and darkness is light because they really have no developed conscience. And yet even within the confines of their conscience, they know that some things are proper and some things are improper. But God has to make it clear what is proper, and he does so through his word. So you can have creation, and you can have conscience, but God gives us also revelation. And the revelation comes through the Spirit of God, through the conviction of God, through the Word of God. And so, a man by reason is not going to be able to obtain knowledge of God because spiritual things need to be communicated by the Spirit of God Himself. And that's why I get back to saying to you that when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, when He really does, there's no arguing yourself out of that. When God's Holy Spirit actually convicts you, when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a sinner, that's an act of God. Because every person I've ever met, starting with me, believes that we're a lot better than we actually are. It takes the Holy Spirit to actually awaken you to sin and to God's righteousness and ultimate judgment. And so when the Lord is speaking, he's making it very clear when he says, come and let us reason together, he's not saying to them, I want you to use your intellect to kind of figure out my ways because God says, my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are above the earth, so far are my thoughts above your thoughts, my ways beyond your ways. There's no way 
that you can figure me out. Therefore, God says, I have to reveal myself to you. No man by seeking finds God. No man can find God out perfectly. God has to reveal himself to us. So when he says, come now and let us reason together, he's not saying, use your intellect to discover my truth. Because what he is saying is, though your sins be as scarlet, God is saying, I want to speak to you concerning the sin condition. And so when God is speaking to us, it's not so that we can reason using our intellect, but rather so that we might understand his ways as it pertains to salvation. And he's saying, the only way that you can have a relationship with me is for you to have my blood wash you and cleanse you. I can make you as white as snow. Even if your sins are red like crimson, I can make them like wool. So he says, if you're willing and obedient, you ultimately will eat the good of the land because a willingness on your part and an obedience to what I have said is going to result in your blessing. Now, the Gentiles are aware of that. They're aware that, that sin has repercussions. And they're going to know that the nation of Israel has actually been unfaithful to God. And the nation of Israel was not faithful to God. Therefore, they reaped what they had, they had sown. And so the Lord is making it very clear that, that the Gentiles are come to, will come to understand that the nation of Israel has actually been unfaithful to God. And he says again in verse 23, as a result, he hid his face from them. He said, I gave them into the hand of their enemies. They all fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness, according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Sin makes separation between God and man. It's not that God's ear is heavy that it cannot hear. And it's not that his arm is too short that it cannot save. But God says that your sins, your iniquities have made a separation. Therefore, I will not hear you. Why? Because the sin issue has to be dealt with first. And so he says they will understand. Now, verse 25, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name. After they have borne their shame and all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, when they dwelt safely in their own land and no one made them afraid, when I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and I am hollowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. The complete return of Israel. This returns after the defeat of Gog and her allies. Notice with me, we just read this. Israel had been in the past in exile, but now she's returned. But once she had rebelled, and now she's going to be obedient. They're going to return to God. And when they return to God, they will follow him completely. Now, I want you to remember, it was God who allowed them to go into captivity. Again, they were unfaithful to him and reap the consequence of the rebellion. All the way back in the early history, when you read in the book of Deuteronomy uh, in chapter 28, in the early history, it says there in verses 64 and 65, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nation, nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. So they had not been faithful. And God from the beginning said, listen, if you don't obey what I say, there'll be repercussions. But he said, I am going to scatter you. Not only though did he say, I will scatter you, but from the very beginning, God said, I will also bring you back. I'm going to bring you back to the land of promise because in the same book, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 3 and 4, it says, The Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. And it always amazes me every time we go to Israel, when you're there, you will see people from various countries who are Jewish. 
You'll see Ethiopian Jews, Chinese Jews, Spanish Jews. You'll see Jews from every, basically many nations throughout the world. You know, there used to be this stereotype that a Jewish person looks in a certain way. That's not true. You will see people in Israel who are Jewish by heritage, and you will see them, and they, they represent many nations in the world. They were scattered, but God brought them back. This is a people who at one time were not a people who are now again a people living in that land. And so God is saying, that I'm going to once again gather you. And once again, ultimately, after all of this takes place, I'm going to bless you. And your chastisement is going to be complete. And you will finally know your God. And you will know your God. And I want you to see this, and we're going to close with this. Verse 29, when he says, you will know your God. I will not hide my face, my face from them anymore for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. How will they know him? He says, I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. Now God in Zechariah 12, 10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And then they will look on me whom they have pierced, Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. I will pour on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. How does somebody know that they have a relationship with God? I want to give you something that I think is very basic and very, what's the word, um, practical. I'm going to close with this. How do you know you have a relationship with God? Now, remember with me, and I'm going to take you through, take a moment. Turn to chapter 36, please. I want to show you a couple things. Verses 26 and 27. How are they going to know? How are they going to know? They're going to know by the presence of the Spirit of God in their life. In chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, this is God's promise. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I am going to take out your stony heart and give you a heart transplant. I am going to pour my spirit out and you will know me. I want to talk to you guys for a moment, something very practical. I'm trying to find a way to say it. Recently I was in a meeting with um, a number of pastors. And Pastor Chuck was there. Pastor Chuck was asked a question. Pastor, what do you see? Or what is your heart towards Calvary Chapel Ministries? We were planning the upcoming Calvary Chapel National International Pastors Conference. Pastor Chuck, what do you see with Calvary Chapel Movement? What is it that you'd like us all to spend time remembering. What is it? Now this to me is so, it's a very personal thing. It's going to be difficult to be able to communicate and I hope it can. Chuck's response basically, and I may have shared this recently, was having therefore begun in the spirit, are we going to be made perfect by the flesh? The one thing that my pastor has said, as long as I've known him, and especially since I've been placed in a position of, of leadership within Calvary Chapel Ministries, as I have heard my pastor speak, the one thing I can tell you consistently that I hear through Pastor Chuck Smith is this, don't do things in the flesh. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord God of hosts. My life, and I have to get personal for a moment, almost testimonial, but there's a practical reason for this. My life was transformed not because 
I simply got sick and tired of being a druggie or being angry, being an alcoholic, whatever. My life was not transformed because I got sick and tired of that. My life did not get transformed because I started going to church. That, had, that didn't transform my life. My life did not become transformed simply because I felt bad about being such a, such a uh, terrible brother and such a horrible son to my parents. That was all guilt, and that was all regret, and that was all grief, and all the things that go along with that kind of mentality, but that did not transform my life. And I can tell you why, because I felt bad about drinking, I felt bad about taking drugs, I felt bad about being an unkind brother, and I felt bad about being a lousy son and to my mom and dad for a long time, but it didn't change my life at all. My life was changed because the Holy Spirit of God baptized me in the power of the Spirit. My life was changed because I heard the word of Jesus when he said, come unto me and drink, and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. My life was changed because I asked God to fill me with this spirit and transform me with this power. Now, the Word of God instructed my footsteps. As I read the Word of God, I began to see the ways of God and what God wants from me and what He doesn't want me to do. That informed me concerning the things of God, but it took the Spirit of God, the power of God, to transform my life. And if there's anything that I see lacking in the body of Christ today, it's the power of the Spirit of God. That's the reason why so many churches are built on entertainment. That's why so many churches are so carnal. It's because the people are not walking in the Spirit of God. And that's my greatest fear for this church, that we can get caught up in the outward appearance and the religiosity and the behaviors that we consider to be Christian and not walk in the fullness of the power of the Spirit of God. God said to them, I will not hide my face from them anymore. I shall have poured out my Spirit on the house of Israel. And I am telling you, it is so easy, and some of you know exactly what I'm trying to say. It is so easy to have religious behavior with no power and love of the Spirit of God. How do I know I've got a relationship with God? God says, I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to put a new spirit within you. I don't believe in these 10-step programs. I believe in one step. I really do. I took a step to Jesus Christ. And when I took that one step, my life was radically transformed. When I said to God, I am sick of who I am and what I do. I need a new life. I need a new way of thinking. I, that, that I didn't understand what I was asking for, but I was asking what God had said he'd give to the Jews, to Israel. He said, I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to give you a new nature. I'm going to pour my spirit on you. And that's what transformed my life. That's what made the Jesus movement the Jesus movement. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what made Jesus' music worship music. That's what made us, our movement so powerful, and that's what we need today. I fear, I fear so much with so many of my, my friends that, that the church is, is, is becoming lethargic and apathetic and, and, and is more carnal and more walking in the flesh. I fear for the general church in the nation. And as a pastor, I want to see my church walking in the Spirit of God. That's the answer. That's the answer. I mean, when you're walking in the power of the Spirit, this thought about going out to the clubs and this thought about doing that drink or, or, or sleeping with that girl or whatever, those things are going to be lost. Why? Because the power of the Spirit is upon you. That's what transformed my life. It wasn't just hearing you shouldn't do that. It was the power of the Spirit. And I'm telling you the truth. That's, that's what made my father come to Christ. I get emotional. Here I go. Sorry. That is what saved my mother. That is what saved my father. That is what saved my sisters and my brother. When they saw an entirely new person in front of them, someone, they knew what I was, and I was replaced with a new life. And that's what Jesus Christ gives. Israel doesn't need more religion. 
Israel needs the Spirit of God, and the body of Christ needs to stop quenching the Spirit and needs to begin walking in it. That's what we need. Listen, when the Holy Spirit has gotten a hold of you, your life radically changes. But the fact is, is a lot of people don't want radical changes. They want to look, act, and be exactly like the world, and that's why they make no difference in this world, because they're afraid to stand up and say, this is true. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he forgives sins. I believe he gives me hope. I believe he gives me strength and courage. I believe that he increases my faith. I believe that he can do things abundantly above all I could ask or think. I believe that by trusting Jesus Christ, my life can be radically different and I can make a difference in somebody else's life. I believe that. I believed that when I was 20 and I believe that now because he does change lives. And it comes to the power of the Spirit of God. That's what makes Israel different. And that's what makes us different. When we stop going to the job site trying to be as cool as the next sinner and start being a light for Jesus Christ, when we stop being ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ and are willing to speak it with, with as much love and faith as they use his name when they're swearing, when we're willing to stand up and be counted, we will make a difference, but not until then. As long as we're chameleons, as long as we want to blend in, as long as we want to be like everybody else, we will not be of any, any use. And Jesus said that salt that lost its savor is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on by man. So for me, I made a decision a long time ago, and it's stronger now than it's ever been, to be a light for Jesus Christ, to walk with him, to love him, and to be known for that. Even if people think, oh, man, well, you're some dorky old pastor. What do you know? I don't really care what people think. I didn't care when I was a 20-year-old hippie. Why would I care now as a senile old man? Doesn't bother me at all. I don't care at all. What do I care? What is it? What is the mark of a believer? The presence of the Spirit of God. And when God's Holy Spirit works in you, I want to give you a couple of things to close by. In 1 John, for example, when God's working in you, uh, by His Spirit, you begin to love His Word, and you begin to walk in His Word. It's an evidence of a transformed life. That's what he says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. The truth's not in Him. Whoever keeps His Word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. We also know that love is the mark of a believer because in 1 John 3, 14, he said, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And we know that we are his believers because he has given us of his spirit because his spirit lives within us and makes us aware that we belong to him. In 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And I can wake up in the morning, and I tell you the truth. I can wake up in the morning, and I can say, Lord, this day is yours, and by the power of your Spirit, I will live a successful Christian life today. I'm going to have a lot of challenges. Lord, you know that. You already know the road that's set before me. I already know that there are going to be things that I have to deal with today that I really don't want to do, and, and in the flesh, I would avoid if I could. But in you, I will overcome today. To, in you, by your Spirit, I will learn to love people. And by you, in your spirit, I will learn to love your word, and my life is going to be transformed because I want people to see me, and when they see me, I want them to see you. That's what I want, Lord. And I started that when I was 20 years old. Haven't arrived. Haven't arrived. But I'm not the same man I was at 20. Radically changed, day by day, by the power of the Spirit, the grace of God, and the mercy of Jesus Christ, radically transformed, radically. And that came by the Spirit. And what did God say? God said to the nation of Israel, I'm going to pour my Spirit on you. You're not going to be a religious nation. You're going to be a righteous nation. You're not going to be caught up with, with the law of Moses. You're going to know the grace and mercy that comes through my Son, Jesus Christ. You will look upon him whom you have pierced and you will mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. And you're going to understand that he died for you and that will radically change you. 
when you understand that he died for you, when you take that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son scripture, and when you start saying God so loved, and you put your own name in there, God so loved David Rosales that he gave his only begotten son. When you start understanding that, your life changes. Not until then. When you start understanding that God loves you and gave his son for you, and God can transform you and pour his spirit into you and make you so radically transformed that those who know you best will not recognize you because of the transformation that comes through a fellowship with him. When you understand that, when you stop telling God, oh, you can't change me, and you get to the point where you say, God, you have to change me, you'll see some changes. You'll see some changes. And when you stop giving him just one room of the house and you finally say, take the whole thing, you watch what God does. He will do something so remarkable in you that you will just rejoice. And the funny thing about it is you won't even realize what's taking place until someone brings it to your attention and says to you, man, you've changed, haven't you? And you say, no, because the closer you get to the Lord, the more your imperfections you see. The more of your own imperfections, the more humble you become. The more humble you become, the more like Jesus you are. So no, you're not running around saying, I have arrived and you sinners haven't. What you start saying is, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And God says, I am merciful to you. And I will transform you because you were, were lost in sin. Now you are found. And now you're my child. And now I will show you every day how deeply I love you. And that comes through a relationship with God. And he will have that with Israel. And he can have that right now with us.